Welcome to Team Perry's Step Out of Line podcast, featuring co-hosts Perry and Lori Finkelstein. Together, they explore, meet, and share inspirational stories with guests who have made a positive impact in today's world. This podcast resonates with our hope to make this world a better place one step at a time through love, acceptance, and uplifting conversations. I don't know that I ever truly felt in line. I was diagnosed with a learning disability in the second grade. I knew from fairly early on that school didn't make all that much sense to me. And one of my earliest memories of that diagnosis was that during gym class, I had to go see the psychoeducational consultant at my school. And so I love Jim. Jim was like my favorite thing. And we were playing floor hockey and we had these teams and I was like super competitive at floor hockey, even in the second grade. And my teammates would be like, well, we need you. Why aren't you there with us? And I was like, oh, I didn't want to tell anyone that I was going to get special help because I thought it made me stupid. And there was this huge stigma attached to it. And so from really from there, I felt like this difference, this like, I don't really fit in. And throughout the time that I was in school, you know, I wasn't fully aware. That wasn't the moment necessarily that I went out of line, but it felt like that was the beginning of sort of feeling different and not really understanding where I fit. Um, I grew up in a household with an accountant for a father and a teacher and educator for a mom. And my sister was a straight A student and I was expected to be a professional, a doctor, lawyer, accountant, some sort of business person. And I didn't understand how I fit into that mold. Um, I was always creative and, and I you know, wasn't really interested at all that much in school. And I liked listening to stories, but struggled to read. Um, even throughout high school. And, you know, I used to joke I could run longer than I could sit down and read because reading made me exhausted, but running energized me. It felt like in line was somewhere over here on the left. And I was somewhere in the middle trying to sort of get back in line, figure out how I fit in. But I kept sort of not being able to, to get close enough to that. Um, I mean, my earliest memory of being entrepreneurial was that I had an old pair of Michael Jordan basketball shoes. They were falling apart a little bit and I got a new pair and I asked my mom, I was like, I know a kid at school who wants to buy them from me. And she was like, no, we need those as your second pair for you know the summer because you might get them wet or you're going to summer camp and you need an extra pair of shoes. So I want you to have them as a backup. And so I decided that didn't make any sense to me. And this kind of goes to this notion of falling out of line is like, it's not that I thought that the rules didn't apply to me. I just thought the rules didn't make any sense and were somewhat arbitrary. And I always thought if I negotiated hard enough or I thought about it long enough, there was always a way around whatever restriction was put on me. And so instead of selling my shoes, I rented them to this kid, the months that were left in school, which were like three or four months. And when my mom asked where my shoes were, I said, oh, don't worry, I'm going to get them back. I rented them. The, the other sort of place that I really stepped out of line was in my undergrad. Um, I thought I was going to go to school for business and economics. Um, I had a little bit of political science in there and the sort of thought about how to take classes that my parents would feel comfortable with and that I would get a real job with. Um, It turned out that I ended up focusing on creative writing, uh, almost not by choice. The other classes just didn't work for me. I was sitting in lecture halls with 300 people in books that didn't make any sense and it was all theoretical instead of practical. By then I had already run some small businesses and was very entrepreneurial, but when I sat in a 101 
business class, I was just bored to tears and just couldn't find the motivation or concentration to sort of get through it. Um, and what I could get through was, um, was the creative arts. And so I really did that as a path of least resistance so that I, I dropped out of school the first time actually. And so this was my second attempt at going back to school. And I was already um, around 24 when I started my second undergrad attempt. And it was, how do I just get through it? How do I find the classes that will give me enough credits? And when I got into fiction writing um, and then I found filmmaking and filmmaking to me was a massive adventure. It was a hustle. It took the elements of writing that I really liked and dramatizing scenes. But, you know, when someone asks, what is a film producer? It's someone who doesn't take no for an answer. That's it. So that's the only criteria. <laughs> Now you can learn the craft of story and you can learn the elements of filmmaking and the technical side and what pieces you need. But fundamentally, especially as a young filmmaker, when you have no money, it's how do I convince people to do things that for free? How do I get favors? How do I pull things together? Uh, we found people to work on our films at the grocery store. Like I was in the grocery store and we were just uh, buying food and we saw a guy and he's asking, we ended up starting a conversation. And I'm like, hey, have you ever worked on a film set? You want to come be a PA? He's like, okay, sure. I had an amazing teacher, Maureen Bradley at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. And she started a, a film program that it was the first year. Uh, my second year there was the first year that the program started. And I just caught the film bug. And I was like, this is the most fun and exciting thing that I can do. And there wasn't any money in it and I saw really no future in it. But um, my wife at the time was like, well, she was American and she was like, well, if you're really serious about this, then you should go to Los Angeles. And I got through undergrad. I didn't know what I was gonna do next. And I went down and toured the three main film schools in Los Angeles, USC, UCLA, and AFI, the American Film Institute, and the American Film Institute was the place that resonated the most with me. And so I applied there. Uh, I had no backup plan. I didn't apply to any other schools. I had no idea what I would do if I didn't get in. And for about four months, I kind of held my breath uh, as I finished my undergrad and waited for the results of that application. And I ended up getting into AFI. Uh, we moved to Los Angeles. I did the AFI conservatory program in screenwriting um, and focused on learning the craft of story. And what I loved about screenwriting was that there was a formula, even though there's so much variation within the formula, there are certain, it's, it's, it's almost more as much about architecture as it is about the creative craft. Like you, there are pillars in a screenplay that, uh, that build the structure of it. And I found that really intriguing. Um, and so from there, after school, I was writing and producing for a while. And, you know, it was in 2009 when the film industry had and the whole economy had this massive collapse um, or contraction is more accurate. And I had a young kid to support at the time. And I had, you know, bumbled around out of school for about three or four years and had a few projects here and there, but re realized just how difficult that world was uh, and got an opportunity to go back to Toronto and join an innovation and design firm, the likes of an IDEO or Frog, if you know those companies, where we worked um, as business strategists and innovation strategists doing research on the changing nature of society and how really large organizations would build their business strategy. And it felt like I you know, got a master's degree in the arts and then went and got a master's degree in business, just being around that, in, in, involved in that company. Uh, the amount that I learned about how big companies work and how they develop products and services and what is the uh, process within them to sort of look at the way the world is and evaluate the change and then build their strategy and, and just a whole language that I was never exposed to where you have a lot of NBAs, um, a lot of futurists looking at the world in different, uh, in different, 
just in completely way in ways that I had never had exposure to before. And I built a, uh, a media and communications department within that company, which allowed me the opportunity to see every different department within the company and help them communicate what they were doing to the organizations that we were working for. Uh, and that really gave me a sense of taking the skill sets I learned as a storyteller, applying them to a type of content that I had never seen before. And we created really new forms of filmmaking where it was a hybrid between a short film, a music video, and a PowerPoint presentation that articulated business strategy that articulated research from anthropologists that articulated research from futurists and a lot was about um, how technology that was not yet commercialized could be applied and how it would impact the world once it was scaled to a level of like an iphone so imagine here's the technology technological capability of an iphone but let's Think about it in 2004 before it's ever come out and we would build these future videos of what would the world look like once this technology is matured now you have your own company that does this storytelling but in a filmmaker version of it in 2020 i had my own company doing something very similar to what i described which was taking visions of the future and creating media around them and helping companies identify uh, the next opportunities. And in the process of running that company, uh, I met my co-founder of Lodic.ai mm -hmm. and we created a vision for an insights and data company that could help people better understand themselves. So we basically did what we were doing for other companies for ourselves and said, how would individuals better understand themselves through storytelling? So we harness the transformational power of story, how, and by story, we mean, how do we understand our experiences on a daily basis? Each one of us recounts those in a way that reflect how we interpret our, the world around us. And it's not just what we say, but how we say it. And so we use AI and machine learning to analyze people's stories and help them get more information about themselves. And at the same time, we're building one of the most comprehensive and complete uplifting communities that supports mental health and um, changes in behavior that help people live better. I know you have a podcast, Mind the Alex Breakdown, and you talk about mental health and issues like that. You must use your experience tremendously. I've learned so much from everyone that we've spoken to. Uh, we get an enormous number of experts on there that have shared information that, that has you know, been really beneficial. And I think each one of us is in some form of relationship with our mental health. You know, Sometimes when people say mental health, they think mental illness and many people have that, but that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is just we wake up every day and we have to process what happened to us the day before and make meaning from it. And as we do that, you know, humans are programmed to have a negative bias because that's our survival mechanism. We're not necessarily programmed to learn or taught how to be happy and how to uh, reinforce the behaviors and the thinking processes that can increase our sense of well being. And so for me, um, you know, I, the way I grew up, uh, I was evaluating risk. How, what are the challenges to, to whatever I'm thinking about doing? Uh, how do I keep myself safe? And I have definitely spent a lot of time trying to expand that, trying to see opportunity, trying to um, live better in, 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 my own, in my own right. And when we say better, we don't necessarily mean life will be perfect ever. It's just that every day we're taking incremental steps, we're learning from the challenges that we've had, and we're finding ways to not just always repeat the same mistakes, right? We're trying to get just a little bit better um, and make life a little bit easier for ourselves. And I was speaking to my uncle 
two years ago, before the pandemic even, and, and then during the pandemic. And I said, you know, I'm really, I've never had such a hard time in my entire life as I had now understanding everything. I thought we were quarantining for two weeks and then we'd be done, it would be over. You know, I wasn't ready for it. And he said to me something very important. And, and you know, my, my kids also understood it. You might bend, but you're not gonna break. And just mm. hearing that, I was like, okay, I'm, I've never bent before, but now I'm bending, but I, I'm not gonna break. And um, I think that's important, like for myself, that that's what got me through the pandemic and what keeps getting me through it. You know, it, not that it's just gonna get better, but I can take it because I could just move with it and then just move on. Learning to pivot and learning to prioritize what you're gonna get crazy about and what you could deal with and then just what you just can't change. And, and you know, it's just a matter of your mindset. We have to be okay not to be okay. People have still have an enormous amount of judgment about it. And part of the mission of the podcast and really all the work that I've done is just because you're not okay in the moment doesn't mean you're not okay ever. You know, there was so much, there's been so much stigma about saying you're not okay that people refuse to acknowledge when things are really bad for them or really struggling. And they just try to push through it because they think they're going to be painted with this brush forever. But just like we're going to bend and not break, you're going to bend backward. We're, we're going to bend and then we're going to come back to, to equilibrium. And if we never acknowledge it and we don't have the uh, acceptance to admit where we're at, then it makes it harder to come back to an equilibrium. Scanning Instagram, you see quotes all the time, but it's like the first trauma is that there was trauma. The second trauma is that there was no support and no help. And if we aren't able to talk about it, we're not able to get the help we need, even if it's just admitting it to one other person or to ourselves. So, you know, we're, we're happy to be able to create a platform where people can have real authentic communication and we can stop uh pretending all the time and find out what's real and then go from there because that's how people will will heal i hope so as a podcaster i know when we finish interviews and we both look at each other most of the time and say oh my god that was like do you have that feeling also like the best feeling ever to make this connection with somebody and then walk away from it like a changed person like the whole medium is very surreal and to be able to facilitate these types of connections is great. You know, as much as I uh, complain about digital digital life and want to spend more time uh, not staring at a screen, it does allow us to make connections that we would never otherwise make. And uh, you never know who you're going to talk to. It's pretty awesome.